Hello everyone, well it's been a wee while since I've made a physics video, a couple of months now So I thought well, what should my next video be? And there I was sitting in a lovely garden on a lovely warm day eating a cone And it occurred to me, I know what I'll do, I'll make a video on the famous inverted cone question Because that, that's an interesting question in itself But it also illustrates a very very few important points, principles and techniques in physics that we have to master, if, especially if we want to take the subject further. So what's this inverted cone question? Here I have a cone, a plastic cone, and I've got a block stuck on the rim with blue tacks. Nothing interesting about that. If I take the block off the blue tack, put it on the, put it on the rim, let the block go, and it slides down. As we, as we would expect it. However, if I put it on the rim without the blue tack and I rotate it, I rotate the cone not too quickly so that it pops out and not too slowly so that it doesn't slide down, the block will stay in place. And that's a very interesting physics question. Not too difficult, but it does illustrate a, a few very very important points when you do this question comprehensively. So the question we're going to ask then, what must the minimum period of the cone be to prevent the block popping out and what will the, what must the maximum period of the cone be to prevent the block sliding down? Remember the maximum period will correspond to the slowest rotational speed and the minimum period will correspond to the maximum rotational speed. So our question is what are those relevant periods? What will the max what does the maximum period have to be to prevent it sliding down and what will the minimum period be to prevent it to prevent it sliding up? Remember a period is the time it takes to make one revolution. An interesting physics question and let's see how we solve that problem. Well, the first thing we have to do here is identify what sort of problem this is. And it's a force question. This is a force problem. So we need to use Newton's laws of motion. In this particular case, we'll be using Newton's second law of motion, where the sum of the forces acting on a body is equal to the mass of the body times the acceleration of that body. But remember, forces are vectors. This is a vector question. So we're interested in very much in the direction of the forces acting on our body, and they're not always horizontal or vertical. Now, why this is such a useful question is it's because it reminds us what's meant by the resolution of a force, or the rectangular components of a force. We're not always good at that sort of thing, and we need to be good at it to be able to solve questions like this, and other questions as well. So the we have so got a short video here explaining what's explaining what's meant by the resolution of a force or finding the, re the rectangular components of a force along two defined directions which correspond to our coordinate system, whatever we choose that to be. Suppose we have a force vector and we wish to resolve it into its rectangular components. First we need to choose the direction of our xy coordinate system. In this case, for simplicity, we will choose x to be in the horizontal direction and y to be in the vertical direction. But we need not choose these, and we could have chosen other directions as well, as we shall see. Then the first thing we do then is draw a rectangular box around our vector, as shown. The vector starts at one corner of the rectangle and ends at the other corner. And it has sides along the x-y axis. We then draw two vectors along the sides as shown. These are the rectangular components of our force vector and they're drawn in a different colour. In this case, the vectors are pointing in the positive directions so that the head-to-toe addition rule for vectors is obeyed. I'm assuming you're familiar with that. If we assign an angle to this diagram as shown, then the magnitudes of our rectangular components are f cos theta in the x direction and f sin theta in the y direction. Now if we put actual values in, theta is equal to say 30 degrees and f is equal to 20 newtons, then the component 
of our vector in the y direction is 10 newtons and the component of our vector in the x direction is 17.3 newtons. So what does this all mean then? Well, equivalently, if we have a force pulling on the object in the x direction with a force of 17.3 newtons, and we have a force pulling in this, on the same object in the y direction with a force of 10 newtons, then this will have exactly the same effect as a force pulling the object with a force of 20 newtons and 30 degrees to the horizontal. And that's what's meant by the rectangular components of a vector, in this case, a force vector. Now, before we embark on a question like this, it's natural to ask what might our maximum and minimum periods depend on? Well, it's pretty obvious that it probably depends on the coefficient of friction between the block and the slope. And we need to make sure that that actually was consistent with our formula at the end that we're, looking, that we're trying to find. So in other words, if the coefficient of friction was very high, that would mean the surface, these two surfaces were quite sticky, we would we'd probably get away with greater uh, periods. In other words, slower rotational speeds. And we need to make sure that our formula was consistent with that. So our next question is, well, how do we find the coefficient of friction between the slope, inside slope of the cone, and the block? Well, a, this is another excellent example and the resolution of forces, and we do come up with a wee formula, and we can do a wee simple experiment here to find out what that is. So let's find the coefficient of friction between a box and a slope. And the slope corresponds to our cone. The slope has an angle theta, and the block is on the verge of slipping. Now it's very important that we state that the block is on the verge of slipping, because this is when we evaluate the coefficient of friction between the block and the slope. So that has to be stated. Now the first thing we do is determine our coordinate system. Now if you look at this, we can see if that block is going to go anywhere, if it's going to accelerate anywhere, it will be accelerating down the slope. So we choose our x-axis to be parallel to the slope and the y-axis perpendicular to the slope. The directions are shown on the inset coordinate system and if you note down the slope is in the negative x direction and up the slope is in the positive x direction that's what I've chosen here so now let's draw the three forces acting on the block on the slope now we can see that the weight of the block is acting vertically downwards always acts vertically downwards irrespective of our choice of coordinate system I remember W is equal to M times G. The force of friction on the body is acting up the slope in the positive x direction. It's the force of friction, I should note here, is always opposite to the direction the body is moving in or indeed trying to move in. The force the slope exerts on the body, called the normal force, is perpendicular to the slope and is in the positive y direction. And those are our three forces, and they are all in equilibrium because there's no motion here. The block is just sitting on the slope, just about to move. In other words, they are all balanced, which means the sum of the forces in the x direction have to be equal to zero, and the sum of the forces on the y direction also have to be equal to zero. And indeed, in all other directions as well, but we're only interested in the directions on our coordinate system that will give us all the information that we need. Our job now is to resolve our weight vector along the xy coordinate system. Note we don't have to resolve our normal and friction vectors along the coordinate system because they are already aligned to this axis. So the first thing we do then is draw a rectangular box aligned to the axis, remembering that our weight vector starts at one corner and ends at the other corner. We now see that W sine theta and W cos theta are the resolved vectors along our axis. Remember that W is equal to M times G. Sometimes we say the MG sine theta along the axis is a component of the body's weight down the slope. And 
mg cos theta as a component of the body's weight perpendicular to the first let's deal with the forces in the x direction now these forces are in equilibrium this means the sum up to zero and the statement in bold indicates that then we put in the values and directions and we see that mu n is equal to mg sine theta where the symbols have their usual meanings mu is equal to coefficient of friction between the block and the slope n is a normal force acting on the block m is the mass of the block and g is the gravitational field strength similarly when we do the same with the y direction forces that are also in equilibrium we get the normal forces equal to mg cos theta so we can make a direct substitution and we get mu is equal to tan theta where mu of course is the coefficient of friction between the box and the slope so we don't need to know what theta is but we do need to know what tan theta is to find their coefficient of friction So the coefficient of friction between the block and the inside of the cone is 0 0.25 and we'll use that later on. So let's embark on the next stage of the question. Find the maximum period allowed before the block slides down the cone. So we start off as before, we draw a slope. I've drawn it a bit, steep, I've drawn it a bit steeper this time to make it a bit more realistic. I find my angle beta and I put my block on it. So the first thing I do is draw my forces acting on it, draw a free body diagram on the block. And you can see these forces have the exact same profile as the forces on the wedge, so they should have. Notice the force of friction is acting up the slope as before because we're finding the maximum period. The maximum period are allowed before the block slides down the slope. So the force of friction has to be opposite to that, that intended motion up the slope. Now, now, before we resolve any forces, we have to ask ourselves the question, to what, in which direction should we resolve these forces? Well, remember the difference between this question and the wedge question is the block is going in a horizontal circle. Therefore, the forces acting on the block are not balanced. This is not an equilibrium question, like the wedge question. The forces horizontally towards the centre of, of this horizontal circle have to, have to sum up to the centripetal force mb squared over r or mr omega squared where omega is equal to 2 pi divided by t the period which we're looking for in this case t max so since our acceleration is towards the centre of this horizontal circuit, circle this should be the direction of our coordinate system. The x coordinate should be towards the center or horizontally, and the y coordinate is therefore vertically. So we have to resolve our forces along that axis. Notice we don't need to resolve our weight vector because our weight vector is already in the y in the y direction, so that's fine. But we do have to resolve our force of friction vector and our normal vector along the x and the y axis and that's as you can see that's been done there next thing we need to observe is this the x direction forces have to add up to the centripetal force mb squared over r or mr omega squared and the y direction forces well they are completely balanced because there's no direction vertically so they're completely balanced so the two components of the friction vector and the normal vector going up the way have to be equal to in magnitude the weight vector and that's shown there and when you put all and you can see the, those two statements in bold and you can look at the vector diagram as well and make sure you know how all that comes out that would that's an exercise for you our maximum period is equal to 2 pi times the square root of h into cos beta plus mu sine beta all over g tan beta into sine beta minus mu cos beta where mu is the coefficient of friction between the block and the slope b 
repeat it as an angle, this, the slope of the cone makes with the horizontal and g's the gravitational field strength or the acceleration due to gravity which is 9.8 meters per second per second. To find t minimum, it's the exact same process except you we have to reverse the direction of the friction vector because remember when it's t minimum the inclination of the block is to move up and out of the slope and out of the cone. So our force of friction has to be opposite to that direction and that is down the slope. The, I'll let you do that for yourself, but the answer will be the exact same formula virtually except the positive and the negative change place to give you the minimum period and you make sure that is going to give you a minimum and maximum time. Now if I put the, our values in, the height of the cone was 10 centimetres. The angle it makes with the horizontal is 66 degrees. Gravitational field strength is 9.8 meters per second per second, or 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Put all these values in, we get a minimum period of 0 0.18 seconds and a maximum period of 0 0.36 seconds. In other words, if the cone is rotating any quicker than 5 times a second, the bot's going to pop out. If the cone is rotating any less than three times a second, approximately, the bot's going to slide down. A good physics question now. Resolution of forces, Newton's second law, choosing coordinate systems, uh, and centripetal motion, circular motion. All things you have to be, all things you have to know very, very well if you want to take the subject further and do even more difficult questions. Thanks for watching, I'm Scottish Physicist, and I'll come up with another video soon.